Well, welcome back to this series we're calling The Journey, and we're learning a lot about the life of the Apostle Paul, and by learning about his life, we're actually learning life lessons about our lives. Now, believe it or not, next week is the last lesson of the whole series. So I don't want you to miss the last message of the series, and it's going to be Palm Sunday. We're going to be having communion together, great, very appropriate way to celebrate what Paul lived for and what Easter is all about, Palm Sunday next Sunday. But today... We're on lesson number eight, and I want you to turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 27. If you don't have a Bible, we would love to give you one after the service, and um, uh, we're today going to look at what Luke writes about in the book of Acts. Remember the Dr. Luke wrote Acts, and uh, he's going to give an incredible description. The whole chapter 27 is about a shipwreck. As a matter of fact, it goes all the way into chapter 28, so we're going to cover uh, a chapter and a half today. Uh, but when you look at this, he's giving incredible detail about a shipwreck, and it's almost like you're watching this in slow motion about how much detail there is as this ship slowly just finds the shore, breaks apart, uh, and it's just um, like a movie unraveling uh, before your eyes as you read this. And so because it's about a shipwreck, Surprise, surprise, lesson number eight is called God Uses Shipwrecks, all right? So since we have them in life, the good news is, is God uses them in your life. And when you look at a shipwreck in life, you say, what is that? Well, that's basically anything you face that's adversity. It's a situation that you weren't anticipating, you didn't choose to be in, and you don't wanna be in, but it's happening anyway. Shipwrecks happen in life, and what we wanna remember about looking at this story today is God uses shipwrecks. And a shipwreck season can get so bad that you actually wonder, can God really bring anything good out of this? I mean, this is so bad. Is there any kind of redeeming quality about it? So the answer is yes. Take out your message notes. Uh, You can download those online. And we're gonna do a few things today. We're gonna look at three things that shipwrecks will do. And then at the end of the message, we're gonna look at four things we need to do when we're in a shipwreck, okay? So let's begin and and just remind ourselves about the journey that Paul was on. So here's Paul's four journeys. Remember, we've showed this map. Uh, Scholars have calculated that he walked over 10,000 miles to share the gospel. So that's the equivalent of going from New York to LA four times. Uh, And this particular trip, we're gonna key in on this fourth journey. And notice, at least he doesn't have to walk this time. He's on a boat, all right? And you notice that it's a really smooth red line. And let me just remind you, he leaves from Jerusalem. Caesarea is the port of Jerusalem. Paul has been arrested for two years now. He's been a prisoner. He was falsely accused by the religious leaders. And he appeals to Caesar. Now, because he was a Roman citizen, most people weren't citizens. But if, can you imagine, in the Roman Empire, if you didn't like the judge, you'd be like, oh, yeah, I just want to talk to the president. I wanna talk to Caesar, and you had that right, and they would immediately stop the trial and get you there. So that's what's happening. So he's been a prisoner for two years, and he's finally, uh, as we'll see in the text, uh, this centurion named Julius is assigned as the soldier, officer, to take him to Caesar. And you notice it just like seems like a little lice, red line, just kind of floating through the ocean there. No, no, no. There is a storm that's gonna catch him at Crete, and it's gonna blow him straight to Malta, and they weren't planning to go to Malta, but that's exactly where they ended up. And even though it seems like a really smooth line here, uh, we're gonna read in this story, it is nothing but that. It's everything uh, to do with a storm. And so by the time you see this in Acts 27, Paul begins this journey, and let's start in verse one. So what could possibly go wrong because at least Paul's on a boat? Well, verse one begins with this phrase. When the time came, we set sail for Italy. Ah, let's just take that in. Man, who doesn't want to go to Italy? You know, that's my bucket list. I'm going to Italy. I'm going to set sail to Italy. You know, and I know he's not in the best of circumstances. He's a prisoner, but because he's a Roman citizen, I mean, it's, it's not, you know, uh, you know, just very uh, tight on the ship here. But, but, but at least he's on a boat this time. He's on a cruise ship. What could possibly go wrong? I mean, he's going to cruise right on to Rome. Well, look at, go down to verse 14. It says, but the weather changed abruptly, and a wind of typhoon strength called a northeaster burst across the island and blew us out to sea. Would you please circle the weather changed abruptly? This is real life. What happens in life is, is have you ever just had smooth sailing, life was going good, blue skies, you're like, man, this is great. Have you ever had a day, you're like, man, I'm having a great day, and all of a sudden, a great day turned into a bad day? 
Maybe it was a phone call, maybe it was one of the kids, maybe it was a crisis, but whatever happened, by a show of hands online right here in the room, have you ever had a good day change abruptly to a bad day, raise your hand? Yeah, we've all, yes, listen, we need to take notes today. We all know that weather changes abruptly because we live in Texas. I mean, the weather literally changes abruptly. I mean, weather's like, hey, how's the weather in Texas? It's gonna be amazing. It's gonna be blue skies all week. Oh, just wait. There's gonna be a fire the size of Rhode Island out there somewhere. I mean, it's like, boom, it just happens. So Texas gets us ready for life because just like the weather, we go through shipwrecks. And we all know the weather changes abruptly. And here's what the shipwreck season does. Three things, write this down. First of all, shipwrecks will test you. The, the text tells us that Paul had warned them that they were gonna be in a shipwreck. And don't miss this part because Paul went to the centurion, he went to the captain, he said, listen, God has told me if you go on this journey and you don't harbor here, you're gonna have a storm and you're gonna be in a shipwreck. What does Paul know? He's just a preacher. Have you ever listened to a sermon and said, I need to do that and then ignored it that week? Don't raise your hand. Paul says, God has given me a word, and they go, forget that, we're out. And they're, Paul, we're gonna take you with us on our disobedient journey, all right? And just what he told them was gonna happen, they had a storm, okay? Well, you say, well, how bad can it be? I mean, it's a typhoon, northeast or whatever, I mean, how bad can it be? Well, I want you to understand that this type of weather pattern in the Mediterranean is very, very serious. As a matter of fact, um, in 2023, there was a cruise ship that got stuck in the exact type of environment we're looking at here, in the exact type of season that it's in, okay? And a, a, a Coast Guard rescue, they actually filmed it. So here's a cruise ship in a storm as we hear it described in Acts 27, here it is, all right? Now, well, that is not like the brochure. <laughs> Honey, let's go on a cruise around the Mediterranean, it's gonna be amazing. You know, and, and uh, this is horrible. As a matter of fact, um, no one was fatally injured, but there was a lot of injuries on board. They told everybody on board to get in your rooms and don't go anywhere. Food's canceled, entertainment's canceled, no one on the deck. And they literally put everybody in their rooms and they said that the furniture, even though it's nailed to the floor, started moving around, glass breaking everywhere. This, this, is, this is not the type of cruise that you wanna be on. Now, you can't make this stuff up, but the service before this, there was a couple who has booked a Mediterranean cruise for next year. Now, I, I encourage them, it was in June, so they're good because this weather pattern only exists here. It's like when you book in Mexico, then you figure out why it was so cheap to go to Mexico because it's in hurricane season, but either way, here we are. Now, what I want you to keep in mind is this is a 14-story boat catching 50-foot waves. Paul is in a first-century boat that's on the first floor of what you're watching for two weeks. Storms will test you, all right? And notice this verse in your notes are on the screen, 2 Chronicles 32, verse 31, because some tests are harder than others. Now, this is God testing King Hezekiah. What is God testing, by the way? It says, God left him on his own to see what he would do. He wanted to test his, help me out real life, his what? Heart, circle the word heart. King Hezekiah had praised God, pointed the people back to God. When things were going well, he had told them to trust God. Now things are bad. He's surrounded by an enemy, and God says, what are you gonna do now? God is testing your heart. Now, don't miss this. God already knows your heart. But do you? The scripture tells us that the heart is, above all else, deceitful. It even lies to us. You know how you know what your heart's made of when you're in a storm? You know how you know what you trust and who you're gonna you know, lean on is in a storm? That's when you know. So what's being tested here? Well, your faith, of course. Uh, what else is being tested? How you treat people. You see, Paul, as we read through this, he is not bitter toward the very people that told him, now nah, we're not gonna do what you say, we're gonna go, and exactly what he told him was gonna happen, happened and he stuck with them. Are you gonna forgive? Are you gonna stay bitter? Are you gonna be resentful, Paul? Or are you going to move on, show grace? And Paul shows a lot of grace to these people who ignored his sermon and took him with them. And he's tested in that. What else is God testing? Well. Uh, let me ask about a show of hands online right here in the room. How many of you guys have ever done, I mean, they've got so many names for them now, but have you ever done like a Tough Mudder or like the Spartan uh, deal or like maybe even like a Murph, like some kind of CrossFit craziness where you just do like this huge obstacle course and just to see if you can make it? Has anybody ever done this? Raise your hand. Uh, lots of people's hands up. I just wanna see how many crazy people, real. Uh, it's like, wh why did you do that, right? 
You know, it's like, why? I mean, because a ton of people do it. It's like, I'm going to jump in mud up to my neck and crawl across there while things explode around me. It's going to be amazing. And you're going to pay for that, right? You want to do that. What, what is, listen, don't miss this. Inside of every man and every woman is a question. What am I made of? What can I endure? We want to sign up for it. We don't want God to sign us up for it. <laughs> but shipwrecks test what we're made of. You don't know about perseverance till you have to do it. You don't know how deep your roots go till the winds blow. Shipwrecks will test you, and they'll ask you very personal questions that you can't lie. Are you conceited? Are you self-reliant? Or will you depend and trust in a living God? So you have these tests. Here's what else it'll do. Write this down. Shipwrecks will also refine you. Shipwrecks will ask the question of you, what really matters? And they will give you extreme clarity in a crisis. And what a shipwreck will do is refine your priorities and even your focus in life. Everybody remembers the Titanic, right? Uh, you know, like, well, at least you watched the movie, which is, I mean, not even realistic. Like, what is the Titanic about? A couple on the front of a boat going, yeah, no. Everybody, I mean, this is serious. The ship sank. I mean, half the people died. And I still think there was room on that door for him too. But either way, crazy movie. But in the real Titanic, some of the most wealthy people in the world were on that boat. I mean, it was a who's who list of the most influential, significant, rich people. As a matter of fact, the combined, combined net worth of just the first class of the Titanic was worth over 500 million in that day, which is roughly about 12 billion today. But what happened when all those rich people heard that the boat's sinking? Focus changed. There was refinement is what happened. All of a sudden, they were gonna leave the cars. They're gonna leave the clothes. They're gonna leave the jewelry. They're gonna leave the artwork. We're gonna leave the silverware. We're gonna leave everything that we say really matters. And all of a sudden, the stuff that we're holding on to doesn't matter where's the lifeboat. You see, a shipwreck will refine you and all of a sudden show you with clarity that's trivial. That's temporary, that actually doesn't matter, and it will actually help you get some clarity, and here's what happens. Look at verse 18 of our text. It says, the next day, so this thing's going on for days, guys. As the gale force winds continued to batter the ship, the crew began, help me out, four words, what did they do? Throwing the cargo overboard. This is what shipwrecks do. Shipwrecks separate what matters and what doesn't matter. You start to realize that you hold on to a lot of stuff you actually don't need. You see on that trip, it's like, you got a hold of your suitcase, like, I really like my suitcase. I mean, I got my suitcase, and I like everything in my suitcase. I packed it myself. Oh, yeah, well, right now, it's either you or your suitcase are going to get thrown overboard. Buy suitcase. All of a sudden, I have extreme clarity. And the more intense the storm, the more intense my clarity gets. Look at the next verse. So it keeps going. The following day, verse 19, the following day, they even took some of the ship's gear and, and what did they do? Three words and what? Threw it overboard. Here it goes. This storm got so bad that even things they thought were essential, now they realize are not essential. Shipwrecks will wake you up. What really does matter? What, what really is important? What, what am I wasting my time with? You get more clarity when you have a crisis. And the more intense it is, the more you realize what really matters. Now look at verse 20. It says, this terrible storm raged for many days, blotting out the sun and the stars. Now darkness creates depression and, 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 and isolation, but also the stars are blocked out. This is very important because navigation, they didn't have GPS. The only way they could tell where they were was by the stars. And now they have no idea where they are, where they're going, or what's happening. They're literally lost on the open sea until at last all hope was gone. Wow, this, this test lasted for two weeks and there is a refinement because the seas kept roaring, the waves kept pounding the boat, and the wind kept blowing, and the more intense it got, the more clarity they had. Now, one of the challenges I'm gonna ask you to do today is, please don't wait for a shipwreck to throw things overboard. What do you say today? We just say, you know what? Where do I need to realign my priorities, and what do I really need to focus on in life? Because 
If you hold on to stuff that doesn't matter, you're gonna miss God's best, you're gonna miss his plan, and you're gonna miss his will because you're holding on to things that are trivial. You just didn't realize it. So look at Hebrews 12, one, and uh, say the first nine words with me, real life. Let's say this together. What does it say? Let us throw off everything that weighs us down. That's your assignment this week. Throw off everything that is weighing you down. Notice this, and the sins that so easily distract us. Did you know there are things that weigh you down that aren't sin? We get so tied up, well, this isn't a sin. We're sitting in the 10 commandments, but still not good for you. You see, it, it, there's, there's sin that distracts and definitely get rid of that, but also everything that weighs you down and with perseverance run the race that lies ahead of us, okay? So here's the assignment. This week, I'm gonna ask you to ask God's spirit to show you what needs to go overboard and then throw it overboard. You know what, I'm gonna throw this overboard. Now I want you to circle these two words, let us do this. Okay, so you need some other people. If you wanna really travel light, hang out with people who travel light. Don't hang out with people that hold on to stuff and think stuff is defining them or stuff is status because it's not. But, it, but what do you say? You say, you know what, I'm gonna throw some things overboard. You wanna get healthy physically? You gotta throw some things overboard. You wanna get generous with what God's given you? You're gonna have to throw some expenses overboard. You wanna get uh, really intentional about who you're connected to? You're gonna have to throw some things overboard so you have time to be in a life group, to serve, to, to lean into the things of God because if, if you don't throw some things overboard, then you're not gonna make it through the shipwreck. It refines you. And God has, listen, God has things ahead for you that you will never discover until you deal with what you're holding on to. So what do you say you just throw it overboard? I'm gonna throw my pride overboard. I'm gonna throw my selfishness overboard. I'm gonna throw my self-reliance overboard. I'm gonna throw my acting like I have no problems overboard and I'm gonna lean into this incredible mystery. And I want you to write this down because shipwrecks will actually get you to your destiny. And I want you to know the longer I live, the more this is a mystery because God will get you exactly where he wanted you to be through a crisis of absolute turmoil you don't even understand. And when you're going through a storm, you don't realize that God's getting you to your destiny. Because when you're in a storm, what are you focused on? You're focused on what's happening in the moment. And if you're not careful, you're discerning the moment in a wrong way. What do I mean? When something bad happens to you, what do you think about God? If you're not careful, you're like, well, God is obviously mad at me. I have a flat tire. God obviously hates me because I just got fired. God is obviously judging me because I just got a bad call from the doctor. Hold on, friend. Paul is in the center of God's will, spoke the truth to everybody on the boat. He is God's man and God's missionary, and he's in the middle of a shipwreck and everything's falling apart. And he didn't miss God's will. He's in the center of it. And sometimes we look around and think, well, I must be missing it. God must be mad at me. No, no, God is directing even through the shipwreck. Did you know that God is not panicked when you go through a storm? You see the patterns in, in the Mediterranean, the weather. God didn't look down from heaven and go, Paul's in a storm, 911, get some angels. We got to, no, no, no. I got you. I need you to get to Malta and I'll get you there. And all of a sudden through this crisis, you end up exactly where he wanted you to be, doing exactly what he wanted you to do and what he had planned all along for your good. Remember Joseph in the Old Testament? His brothers mistreated him. And don't miss this. A lot of times we focus on people too much in pain. What happens? Well, we, we say, well, it's all their fault. Well, they did this. Well, they, if they had just done this. And what happens is, is we get lost in the blame game. We hold on to bitterness and we miss the destiny because we're blaming people. But friend, listen, those people, yes, they did hurt you. And yes, they did mistreat you but they got you exactly where God wants you to be, so stop focusing on the people, focus on God's purpose, because Joseph told his brothers later, he said, you didn't sell me into slavery. You think you mistreated me? You think you, you know, uh, stabbed me in the back? You think I resent that? No, this is what Joseph said. The Lord led me ahead of you to Egypt. God got me exactly where he wanted me to be to do exactly what he wants me to do, and by the way, God's destiny is always to bless others if you'll trust God. So here's what Paul does, Acts chapter 28, verse one. It says, once we were safe on shore, and that's just an understatement, like it's like, boom, man, we've, we've made it. 
we learned that we were on the island of Malta. I love this because they didn't know where they were. Have you ever been in a storm and you've got your life so mixed up, you're like, man, where am I? What day is it? What is happening? It's like, where am I? You're on Malta. Okay, I'm on Malta. Now, what I love about Paul, many, many things, but I love Paul because you know what he does? Wherever his feet land, that's his destiny. And you know what he does? The next right thing. It says in the text, it's cold, it's wet. Paul's like, we need a fire. You know what Paul does? Starts collecting firewood. I love this. It's like, lands on the beach and then go, I told you guys, you're the whole reason I'm here. I'm a victim of all this brokenness around me because it's all y'all's fault. And he goes, oh man, we need a fire. Look, we got a lot of firewood. (laughs) There's a lot of broken pieces of ship over here. And he starts to pick up wood. Does the next right thing. I love this. No matter how upside down my life is, I'm gonna do the right thing. Go down to verse three. So as Paul gathered an armful of sticks and was laying them on the fire, a poisonous snake driven out by the heat bit him on the hand. You have got to be kidding me. Are you serious right now? What is happening? I mean, this guy got blown up by a storm off the island of Crete. He has not seen daylight for two weeks. He held on to just the brokenness of a ship and barely made it on shore, literally with just the clothes on his back. And he's just trying to do something nice and do the next right thing. And now a snake, well, God is definitely mad at him. And that's what you think too. You've been through all these trials and troubles and then here comes another one. You're like, God must be mad at me. That is human nature and it hasn't changed and in the text it tells you that's exactly what they thought on Malta too. When he got bit by a snake, literally like there's a snake and did you notice, God, it's not even just a nice snake. You know what, if we're gonna have snakes, no, it's a poisonous snake and it's hanging on his hand and everybody sees it and he turns around and everybody's like, "Mm mm-hmm. This is in the text. I knew he was a murderer. I knew he was doing something wrong. That's why God's judging him. Hadn't changed for centuries. We think bad things mean that person is being judged. Now, God definitely judges people, but in this situation, you know what Paul does? He says he shakes off the snake and keeps gathering wood, and nothing happens to him. Now, watch this. It says in the text that all of a sudden, the snake bite got everybody's attention. And now all of a sudden, of course, what got their attention is all these people showing up on the shore, and then the snake bite has Paul singled out, and then when nothing happens and he makes it through the hurt, he's the hero. Now Paul is the person who has the floor. He can say whatever he wants. He's the man of significance. Don't miss this. When you go through your hurt and you trust God, even the hurt is your destiny because God doesn't waste a hurt. Are you the guy that got bit by a snake? Yes. Nothing happened to you? Yes. Can you pray for me? And look, I love this text. I want you to just underline this in your Bibles. Acts 28, verse seven. Go down to verse seven. Here's the phrase I want you to mark down. Near the shore where he land, where we landed. Now, this is so understated in the, in the English language because you think of how big that map is that I showed you. You think of the odds that they're gonna land in Malta. They thought they were going down to Egypt. They didn't know where they were. But, and all of a sudden, they land in Malta. And Malta's a big island. They land exactly where God wanted them to be, exactly where Paul was supposed to be. There just happened to be, look at it in the text, there was an estate belonging to Publius, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us and treated us kindly for three days. And as it happened, just circle those three words too, as it happened, you know, it just happened. Publius's father was ill with a fever and dysentery. You see, Publius is praying, Lord, help my family. I have a family member who is sick and God says, oh, we got Paul out here in the ocean. My goodness, man, look at all the shipwreck. We're just gonna get him right here. And right where Paul landed, listen, wherever you land, that is your destiny. If you look back at your shipwreck, you're gonna miss your destiny. But if you look forward, all of a sudden he's like, how can I help you? And they said, Paul, we need you. And what does Paul do here? It says, Publius' father was ill with fever and dysentery. Would you read the next seven words? What, what happens to Paul? Paul went in and prayed for him. I don't want you to miss this because Paul didn't go in and go, man, this is a really cool estate, you know? I mean, I wish I had an estate. I've been serving God for a decade now. I don't have anything. I just blew up on the shore over here. Man, life is hard. I mean, my life is, I mean, ever since I said, Jesus, I'll follow you, it's just been one problem after another. 
Y'all got any food or anything? Can I stay in your room? You got a guest house? Nice pool? No. Paul shows you that he has passed the test. He's shown you that he has been refined by life itself. And he shows you that wherever he lands is his destiny. And he also shows you that, friend, your destiny is always to bless others. He walks in the house and said, who needs help? He does. I'll pray for him. Look at what happens. Pray for him. Man, laid his hands on him, healed him. If you get your eyes off of your shipwreck and your snake bites, you're gonna see people who are hurting and that you can help. Look at verse nine. Then all the other sick people in the whole island came and were healed. My goodness, the entire island of Malta has a revival. Don't stay on the shore looking back at your wreckage. Look forward at all the people that God has right around you. Austin campus, within seven miles of this campus, there's 186,000 people and 67% of them don't believe in Jesus. This is our beach. We are expanding our kids' building because we're making more room for people who are hurting and behind all the nice houses are hurting people. Corpus, we're gonna be breaking ground in a month on an island. (laughs) And you may feel like you got shipwrecked on North Padre Island, but we're going to build a lighthouse for the 18,000 people on that island who are hurting and behind nice houses are hurting people. Yeah, we can clap for the Lord, this is great. So what are we gonna tell them? We're gonna tell them about our lives, our story, the grace of God and how we got bit by a snake and got in a shipwreck and God still was faithful and he'll be faithful to you. Now look at verse 10. As a result, I love this, as a result of Paul's faith, everybody on the boat is gonna get blessed. We were showered with honors. And I don't want you to miss this. Your decisions affect everybody else on your boat. Husbands, your decisions affect everybody else in your boat. Dads, moms, parents. When you're at an office, your decisions affect everybody else on the boat. Look at this. And when the time came to sail, people supplied us with everything we would need for the trip. I mean, I wish I could, that's a whole nother message right here. But listen, when you think you've lost everything, God has everything you need. When you think, I have lost my ship, God says, I got another one. When you say, I literally have lost everything and there's no repairing it, God says, watch this, I'm not only gonna restore it, I'm gonna bring it back better. And because you chose to bless others and not stare at your wreckage and at your snake bites, but look at other people's needs and decided to bless and help them, which is your destiny, because you decided that where your feet were is your destiny, it's not a destination out there, it's right here, an entire island has changed. Because all of a sudden, God has everything he needs because his destiny was always to bless. Now, as promised, I wanna focus the last part of our message just on four anchors that we all need. I wanna look at this phrase in Acts 27. So I'll go back in the story. So we kind of saw the whole movie. I'm gonna rewind to this part, verse 29 of Acts 27. It says, so they threw out, this is in the middle of the storm. How many anchors did they throw out real life? How many, help me out, four. Okay, so circle four anchors from the back of the ship and they prayed for daylight. Even if you didn't take notes till this point, I wanna encourage you right now to write four things down that you need to do in a storm. Four anchors that you must have. Even if you have a sheet of paper at home because when I've been through shipwrecks, this is how I got through them, how you need to. By the way, if you're wondering if these stories are true, you can Google this later, but they have actually found one of the anchors from this story. Because of Luke's description and how just definitive he is about it and how unique the place is where they shipwrecked, a diver off the coast of Malta thought it was like a wreckage from World War I or something and actually is one of the anchors from Paul's ship. It weighs over 1,500 pounds and they pulled it out of the ocean. What's, What's the point? Well, the point is anchors last, boats don't. So you better make sure that you choose your anchors wisely, okay? So what are they? Well, when I go through a shipwreck, I'm glad I have four anchors. First of all, I anchor my mind to God's word. Can you imagine going through a storm two weeks long? You're not eating because you're stressed. You're not sleeping because you're emotionally distraught. And then what happens is spiritually, you can ignore the word as well and God's promises. And what it tells us in the text is, is Paul has a vision, and an angel tells him, Paul, you're gonna stand trial before Caesar and everybody on this boat's gonna make it. So Paul comes to all these men on the ship and he tells them in Acts 27, verse 25, something really incredible. So take courage. He's yelling out in the storm, encouragement. For I believe God, 
It will be just as he said, not what they say, not what the news says, not what social media says, not what anyone predicts. It will be as God said. Now notice this. I love this next verse. But we will be shipwrecked on an island. Paul is a realist. He's like, look, this is bad. He's in the same circumstance they're in. But he's the only one on that boat that's got hope because his courage is not in the circumstance. His courage is in God. So you have to decide, you know what? I'm gonna read the word. I'm gonna read God's word. And when I go through a storm, I'm gonna focus on the promises and not the problems. So Paul anchors his hope in God's word. And here's another thing he does. Write this down. Anchor my time to community. You see, when he's in this storm, he's got to focus. He's focusing on the promises of God, and he's encouraging everybody else with that. And so you have to ask yourself, am I reading the word every day? You have to read the word because it is the truth. It's not your feelings. It's not your temporary circumstances. It's the truth. It holds. It's forever. But also, you have to focus on community. What has your attention has you. And what happens is, is a storm, a shipwreck, causes us to run away from God or ignore God or and or ignore people around us. So what Paul does, listen, make sure that your best friend during a problem isn't the problem. It's actually people. It's like, hey, how are you doing? Oh yeah, I haven't seen you in a while. Oh, I know, I have a problem. I've just been hanging out in my room with my problem. This is how human nature works. We close the door, pull the blinds, turn our phone off. Where have you been with my problem? <laughs> your problem is the problem. If you're focusing on your problem, your problem is just getting bigger. Focus on the word, get with people, and watch this. I love how this works. Uh, Acts 27, verse 30. It says, then the sailors tried to abandon the ship. This is human nature. Hey, there's a problem. I'm out. <laughs> hey, we got a crisis. See you. Look, they lowered the lifeboat as though they were gonna get it, put the anchors on the front of the ship. And this, what's the spiritual application here? Again, tough situation. I run from it. Listen, friend, don't. Don't do that. Don't do that. Well, the marriage is really tough right now. Don't leave. Work on it. It's worth it. I'm gonna lean in to the tough situation. I'm not gonna isolate or alienate myself or so nobody can find me. Matter of fact, listen to how Paul says it. Pretty stern here, verse 31 and 32. But Paul said to the commanding officer and the soldiers, you will all die unless you get in a life group. Oh, my bad. No. <laughs> he said, hey, Listen. You, you need to stay on board. So the soldiers cut the ropes of the lifeboat, all right? What is he telling them? He's like, hey, you can't leave. Don't go. The, the way of destruction is to run from the problem. You need community. And so what is, what is our application? When you're going through a shipwreck, friend, hear me. That is not the time to lean out. It's the time to lean in. It's the time to lock arms with other people who are what? In the same boat. That is what life groups are, right? For singles, married couples, you know, men, women. We're in the same boat. When you're in a parenting life group as a young mom, you're like, I just have to confess this to you other moms. Like, sometimes I just want to leave my children and run and move to Mexico. I'm horrible. I'm a horrible mother. I'm so sorry. When you finally confess that, all the young moms look at you and go, girl, us too. Was that Tuesday or Wednesday? I mean, what, why? Because we're in the same boat. And when you're in the same boat, you're facing the same storm and all of a sudden you realize, I need to lock arms with people. And that truly is, seriously, what life groups are all about. You say, well, you know, life's smooth right now. I don't have any storms. Thank God for that, by the way. And if you're in smooth sailing right now, it's the best time to start reading the Bible and get in a life group before the storm. Don't be looking for your Bible when it happens. Know where it is. Don't be looking for a group to connect with. Lean in and get these anchors settled and Make sure this is a habit too. Here's a third anchor. Anchor my mouth to gratitude. And one of the assignments this week, I just ask you to think about what you talk about for one week. You say, what do you mean? I just think about what are you talking about? What is the themes that you speak of? What are you saying? Do you speak gratitude? Do you speak I'm thankful? Do you speak I'm thankful to God? I'm thankful for you? Because what you speak about, literally what you speak about is where your heart's going, where your heart's going is where your life's going. So you wanna speak gratitude. I would encourage you this week when somebody says, hey, how are you doing? Don't start with the problem. And we wanna be real. And sometimes you even need to talk to a counselor, but hear me, friend, if all you do is talk about the problem, think about the problem, and look at the problem, the problem gets bigger. But we say, hey, how are you doing? Just, I wanna encourage you to start every conversation this week with this phrase, you know what, I'm thankful. I'm thankful. 
Because when you start with gratitude, it changes everything about even what you're saying, much less how they're feeling. So was gratitude that big of a deal? Absolutely. Look at verse 35 of Acts 27. Paul, major life-threatening crisis here. He took some bread. Okay, this is the middle of the storm. (laughs) And help me out with the next two words. What did he do real life? What did he do? Gave thanks. I want you to circle this because it's absolutely fascinating to me. I mean, this storm is raging. They have thrown everything overboard. They know they may die. And Paul says, you know what? I just want to give thanks. And in front of all of them, he gave thanks to God before them all and broke off a piece and ate it. I want to encourage you to find something in your shipwreck to be thankful for. So I can't be thankful for the shipwreck in the, in the middle of the storm. Paul sees a plate of food in front of him. He's holding a piece of bread and he said, you know what? I sure am thankful for this bread. And he breaks it. That's why I wanna encourage every parent, please pray before your meals. As a single, just stop. When you get a plate of food, don't be that person that says, well, I don't wanna offend anybody in the restaurant. Or that person says, ah, you know, it's just food. Just pass the fries. No, no, when you're in a shipwreck and you go through a financial crisis, you get a plate of food in front of you, you know. Time to thank God. Thank God, thank you for this food. What does that do? Well, it's not that big a deal just to thank God for food. Yes, it is. Look at the power of gratitude. Look at verse 36. It says, then, circle this word, everyone was, circle this word, encouraged. Your gratitude actually encourages everybody. Why? Because they're all looking at the storm. They're all watching the news. They're all looking at the trends. This is going down. This is going to be horrible. You walk in with gratitude. Man, God's so good. He's so faithful. I'm so thankful for this good thing in my life. I'm so glad that he's with me and he provides for me. And everyone was encouraged. And by the way, how many people are on board? I want you to circle this number, 276 people. One word of gratitude can affect 276 people. Why? Because when you point people to God, where are your words pointing them anyway? When you talk to people this week, make sure that your words are not pointing them to the distress. Hey, how you doing? Well, look at all this. And this is why it's horrible. I got 10 reasons. But instead, God is so good. You know, I'm struggling, I'll be real. I'm I'm really wrestling, but I'm so thankful for his goodness. I'm pointing people with my words to who God is, how faithful he is, how I can trust him, and I'm looking to God, and my gratitude helps others look to God. What my mouth talks about is where my heart gravitates toward, and so, by the way, gratitude is a test. Did you know it's easy to thank God when life's great, although most people don't? You get on a smooth sailing ship to Italy, you're like, look at this, I got this cruise. I did this. But it's easy to thank God. God, thank you, we're so blessed to be on this cruise to Italy. When you go through a storm, there's a test involved. Will you still thank God? Or was it just about the stuff? Will you still thank him for his goodness? Or was it just because everything was good? So just God help us to have an attitude of gratitude. You know, I was thinking about this message and, I thought about this guy, I'll put him on the screen. This guy's name is Blake uh, Prohl. You can kind of Google his story later, but Blake Prohl was uh, drafted by the Vikings. He was following his dad's footsteps. His dream was to be a professional football player. That's what it was gonna be. He's gonna play in the NFL and he made it. He's a wide receiver for three years for the Vikings and showed a lot of promise. Wanted to be just like his dad. His dad was a professional NFL player for 17 years, made it to the Super Bowl. I'm gonna be like dad, that's what I wanna do. Everything was about sports. He said his whole life was about sports. Every day as a kid, this sport, football, 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 football. Three years into the Vikings, he has a career-ending injury uh, in his knee, and he's out. No more football, and he's hitting a shipwreck like we're talking about today. Boom. And you need these anchors, whether it's a physical shipwreck, financial shipwreck, relational shipwreck. You need this, and all of a sudden, he had a shipwreck. Now, the story is pretty amazing, but uh, the summary is, is that He's always kind of liked music, but never really played anything, never played the piano, never sang. But he, he picked up the piano and uh, started to sing. And the only person that heard him was his grandmother. She loved him. You know, we thought, well, every grandmother loves their son. And so he actually put a TikTok video together of him surprising his grandmother, singing for the first time, playing the piano for the first time. He said, hey, Grandma, you want to you wanna hear me sing? Like, you sing? Uh, you sing? Yeah, you want to hear me play the piano? You play the piano? Yeah. He started playing and the grandmother was so surprised and the, the, the whole video went viral and had over like five million views. American Idol calls him up, invites him out. Here he is getting his golden ticket and uh, they predict he'll be in the top 10 of musicians in the country. 
when only two and a half years ago he was at a career-ending industry at a shipwreck where all of his dreams crashed. And I wanna read a, a few quotes from him because it shows you that he found the four anchors we are talking about today. Here's a quote. I would have never learned piano or how to sing if I had not blown out my knees. I think he's thanking God for a knee blowout, even though most football players wouldn't. He says, I love to help people and realize I can help so many through hard times, through music. This guy has so many followers now. He says, I'm impacting more people than I ever, my dad ever dreamed of impacting in 17 years in the NFL. Here's another quote. I am thankful. Wow. He chose gratitude for the gift of music. What else is he thankful for? Oh, look, the comfort of new friends and family, leaning into the anchor of community. And here it is, his Christian faith for carrying him through. One last quote. He says, my faith is very strong. Well, how do you know, Blake? How do you know your faith is strong? Because everything I dreamed of that my dad told me I could do one day was shattered in a moment physically. I couldn't do it anymore. But I know my faith is strong and I really believe that everything happens for a reason. I think this is just one small chapter in a big novel, a big help me out what? I didn't even email him about this. Journey. We're all on a journey of ultimately God's plan. I have a verse in your notes that Paul wrote later after this shipwreck in Philippians 1.21. And I want you to write in what he says here. Because when he's looking back at his life and the shipwrecks and the, the challenges, how did he keep such a strong faith and so focused on keeping God the priority? Well, it says, for to me, and, and what would you put in this blank, friend, when you walked in this room? What is life to you? Well, to me is the next sale. To me is the house. To me is this car. To me is this status. To me is this stuff. To me is what, but for me, I want you to write in his answer. He says, to live is Christ. That's it. It's all about Jesus. And because to live is Christ, man, to die is gain. How could he not be scared of this storm? Because he's like, man, the worst thing that can happen to me is I get to go to heaven. Let's go. He said, to die is gain. Now, I don't know what you walked in here with or what defined your life, but I'm gonna ask you, maybe you're in a shipwreck right now, but look at this verse from our text, Acts 27, 44, because it's when they decided to leave the ship and get to shore, it says the others, just circle these two words, held on to planks of debris from the broken ship so that everyone escaped, and just circle these three words, safely to shore. Because the gospel is God, God's word is the Bible, there's gospel in every verse, and in this verse, we see the gospel in one verse. Because listen, friend, when you have a shipwreck, all of a sudden you realize the only thing that matters is a relationship with Jesus. And what I want you to, I want you to ask yourself is, is, what am I holding on to? What am I gonna grab a hold of that's gonna get me to shore? The ancient writers wrote the hymn, in the sweet by and by, we will meet on that beautiful shore. You see, the reason why Paul wasn't scared is the worst thing that could happen is go to heaven because he had met the way to heaven is Jesus. This whole message can be summarized in this piece of art. It was painted by a guy named Danny Hollebaum. And this person who's on the open waters has chosen wisely. They've chosen wisely that that plank that they're gonna hold on to that's gonna get them safely ashore. I'm gonna hold on to Jesus because he will get me to heaven because he's the way, but it'll also get me through every storm. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And when you choose to hold on to Jesus, matter of fact, write that anchor down. My life is gonna anchor to Jesus. All of a sudden, not only are you looking forward to heaven, but you're not captured by fear or despair in the storm because you know that God will lead you to a glorious destiny wherever you end up. So let's pray about that together. With your head bowed and eyes closed, listen, friend, if you've never trusted in Christ, would you do that now online right here in the room and just place your faith in him? He loves you. And just whisper this in your heart. Just say, Jesus, I need you. And he'll hear you. Just say, forgive me for going my own way. Listen, he knows. And right now, just tell him, Jesus, as best I know how, I choose to follow you and I hold on to that cross. 
And I thank you for the promise of heaven. And I ask you to help me to bless others along the way, even in the storms of my life. If you just whispered that prayer, just let somebody know and thank you. You just found out what this church is all about. God has put us on this shore to bless others. And we've all been shipwrecked and snake bit. But we lift up Jesus and all who look to him will be saved. So Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Paul's life, for reminding us that even when life gets out of control, that you're still in control. And thank you, Father, that when we go through a crisis, not only are you with us, but you are creating a destiny for us. And I ask God for the hope and the love and the joy of Christ to rest in every heart and every home, that you would give us this type of determination, this type of strength, and this type of faith, that no matter how strong the storm, it would refine us. And Father, that we would pass the test, our faith would be strong, and that we would throw off everything that weighs us down and run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And would you help us to bless others with our gratitude and the grace that we have found in Jesus. For we ask this in his name and everybody said, amen. Let's give God a hand for his truth, his grace.